This is a topic I've wanted to talk about for a few years now, but I never felt the urgency to make it, really. But it's clear to me that not only is the college football playoff system dysfunctional, it's set up in a way that's bound to be incredibly dissatisfying to everybody. I'm going to explain exactly why I think that they have such a bad system, go through each year to point out how the system has resulted in so much injustice, then go over what I recommend to fix it. One disclaimer is that I'm a Buckeye graduate, and I feel the need to say this because I have the perspective of a Buckeye fan. Now, it's important that I do this in a year where the Buckeyes made the playoffs in a year where maybe they shouldn't have made it. There is some controversy. Because, if anything, I should be happy with the result right now. But I'm not really, because I think it was unfair. Now, rather than seeing me as a fan, please try to consider the arguments I'm going to try to make to fix college football. I think having a college football playoff is a good thing, rather than using the BCS system I grew up with. This makes sense after the 2019 season especially, because LSU and Ohio State were the top two teams last year, and Joe Burrow going up against the school that he transferred from made for a very nice storyline for a title game. But the thing is, Clemson existed, and they were an undefeated defending champion, and leaving them out would be ridiculous. Because of the playoff, both a deserving Ohio State and Clemson team got a shot to compete at the title instead of just one of them. So I don't think that the solution is going back to the BCS title game, even though that'd probably be ideal for this year or 2018. The college football playoff system isn't dysfunctional because it's only four teams. It's dysfunctional because it's chosen in the most subjective way possible. The criteria for the playoff is for the committee to choose the four best teams. Now, this idea alone is dangerous because the idea of choosing the four best teams devalues playing the games, which is the reason why we play the sport to begin with. It's why every major sports league has tiebreaker guidelines and a system to calculate who makes the playoffs, solely based on wins and losses. I would argue that college football's selling point is how urgent every single game feels for playoff caliber teams, but the four best teams criteria has consistently gone against this philosophy. Every year now, we typically have SEC teams that lost their biggest game of the year get consideration for the playoff because they could be one of the best four teams. Now, the SEC is 100% the best conference when it comes to creating contenders especially, but the current criteria values this conference to the point where teams in the SEC don't even have to prove that they're the best in their own conference to have a chance at winning the title. Fans think it sounds fine because Georgia probably is better than UCF as an example, but this type of thinking devalues the games that are played, because if you can get in while not being the best team in your conference, it allows teams to have an avenue to the playoffs that neglects true urgency. Some other teams may not have an avenue at all. The regular season's goal should be to find the best team in each conference and then have those teams found compete for a title. When you allow the second best team in a conference to make the playoff, you lose credibility in finding the best team that year. This is because the regular season proved through results that they aren't the best team in the nation that year, let alone the best in their conference. A great strength for college football is having the regular season matter. If there can be more than one rep from a conference, the regular season loses all of its value. Having two reps from a single conference is not making a statement. It's saying, hey guys, here's our two teams to compete for a title. We already know that one is better than the other, but thanks for letting us bring a second one. And if the goal of the playoff is to determine who the best team in the nation is, then why are we allowing a team that, in the regular season, proved it's not even the best in its own conference? Is Texas A&M a better team than Cincinnati this year? My answer is probably, but Texas A&M already had a chance to play Alabama, and had they beaten them, they would be in. And we'll never know how a game between Cincinnati and Alabama would have gone. Many people say Alabama would destroy them. This is probably true, but we can't definitively say it. And the people that argue for this logic tend to be A&M fans, who seem already got destroyed by Alabama. We cannot, in good faith, run a system where teams are effectively able to erase a loss while other teams are disqualified for one. And if A&M played better versus Alabama, they could have made the playoff. They had the opportunity, but in the end, Alabama proved that they were the class of the SEC this year. The season proved that they were definitively the best team in the conference, so what is the point in having a second team in the playoff from their conference? Nobody else has earned it. Are A&M justified to say that they should be in? I think that the answer is actually yes, but it's only because the current criteria entitles them to be this way. The best four teams as a criteria is subjective. My point isn't to say that A&M fans are wrong for thinking that their team should be in the playoff right now or that their team isn't one of the best four teams. My point is that the college playoff system is objectively bad for giving a team that has already proven via results to not be the best in the nation the opportunity to compete for a title and claim that they're the best in the nation. And it has to change if the sport wants any credibility in the future. The best four-team system has to go. 
Now the rebuttal to my logic is going to be to say that the path toward making the playoff for an SEC team would be harder than for other conferences if you only let one team in per conference. This is true, but because of the SEC being tougher to win, if you make the playoff as an SEC representative, you're going to have an advantage not only in seeding, but your team will probably be one of the better teams to win with. The reward for being the SEC representative would likely be to be a better chance of winning the title if you actually make it in as the SEC rep, given that you don't have to play any other SEC teams. Now, I want to go through the history of the playoff and talk about where everything went wrong, in my opinion. 2014 was the first year of the playoff, and I think that this year was a huge success for the idea. It seemed clear that Alabama and Oregon were the best two teams in the nation going into the final poll, but they both had one loss. Florida State was ranked third because they had been a bit shaky that year. They were undefeated, but they won ugly, and had they gone with the BCS and chose the current top two teams in Alabama and Oregon, they would have left out the defending champion team that was the only undefeated Power 5 conference champion. So the college football playoff was great here because FSU got exposed, but the playoff gave them no arguments of being shafted. The last spot was the controversial one, and the committee decided to go with Ohio State coming off a Big Ten title win over Baylor and TCU, the Big 12 co-champs. In the end, I think this was clearly the right call because Ohio State went on to win the championship. So the playoffs succeeded even further because it proved that the best team in 2014 won because of their playoff system. If this was the year earlier, the best team in Ohio State would have been left out entirely. And this team winning makes sense when you look back at it. It was loaded with NFL talent but the playoffs' existence appeared to be good because it was more likely to include the best team. Nobody thought the Buckeyes were going to win that year, maybe because of the narratives beforehand. This playoff was great for the sport because it demonstrated that results are a better way to determine a champion than going off of calculations or prior notions. I think the one bad thing to come out of this was what happened to the Big 12 that year. They felt that their teams had gotten screwed over by the lack of the Big 12 Conference Championship game, so they adopted one a few years later. Now, I like conference championships because it guarantees that teams have to face off against good competition as a final test for the playoff, and ideally, it can kind of be seen as a quarterfinals game. But the Big 12 Conference Championship is a bad one in my opinion, and this is because of the lack of divisions. Divisions are an arbitrary way to split up teams and could be considered bad for that reason, but they bring meaning to the idea of the conference championship game. The winners of each division in the other four Power 5 conferences face off for a title game, and this is fine because it serves to prove which division champion is better, and therefore decides who the best team in the conference is. The problem with the Big 12 is that their conference championship game is just the top two teams in the standings facing off against each other. One team has a direct claim to being better than the other already. This is not a division winner facing off against another equal division winner. One team is a one seed and the other is a two seed. This is bad because the two seed gets a rematch that they don't really deserve. This is because they were fairly beaten in the division standings after playing the exact same schedule. At the very least, the one seed should actually get active home field advantage in my opinion, but I don't think that this is the case. Unfortunately, the, this weird championship game now has to happen because the Big 12 saw it as necessary to prove their playoff eligibility. So in summary, 2014 was overall a success. What about 2015? In my opinion, they got it right again, and with even less controversy this time. Sanford being a two-loss champion made it obvious what to do, and include the four conference champions with one loss or less. And in hindsight, lots of people say Michigan State had no business being in because they got destroyed by Alabama. Lots of people were upset that Ohio State had, was a one-loss team coming off a title, and after throttling Notre Dame in a bowl game, they said that they should have been the team that was in still. And in my opinion, as a Buckeye fan, Michigan State was correctly put in the playoff. They deserved to be in. They beat Ohio State when it mattered, then beat a very good Iowa team in the conference title. I was at the OSU-MSU game as a college freshman. The weather was terrible and neither team can move the ball on offense. And I'm not in the excuse business, or the subjective opinion business. At the end of the day, the results have to matter. And maybe Michigan State was not one of the best four teams, but I will defend their right to be there in 2015 until the end of time, because they earned it with their results. So after two successful years, 2016 is where all the controversy began. So did they get it right in 2016? And the answer that nobody is expecting is yes. This is where the takes become controversial, but allow me to explain, because this is a rare circumstance. Alabama and Clemson were obvious inclusions again as zero and one loss conference champions. But then came Ohio State. And Ohio State did not win their conference in 2016 because Penn State won the Big Ten this season. 
and up to this point, a non-conference champion had never made the playoff. As a Buckeye fan, this is probably where you think I'm biased, but I'm actually pretty convinced I'd agree with the committee on this one, even if I was not a fan of Ohio State. This is the only time in the history of the playoff where a non-conference champion was the best team in their conference. I say that the goal of the regular season should be to determine what the best team in each conference is, and I still think the regular season achieved that in 2016. It just wasn't done by seeing who the conference champion was, like usual. This Penn State team had a loss to pit out a conference, and then they lost to Michigan by 39 if I remember correctly. And that's straight up embarrassing. Michigan was a serious contender this year, and if not for a loss to Iowa, we may think of this season differently. Penn State handed Ohio State their only loss and a miracle comeback in the fourth quarter. Not that it matters, but Ohio State probably should have won the game because they were dominant in it. They ended the season 11-1 with a three-point loss to a good team. A game that maybe they shouldn't have won, though, was against Michigan. Now, I still believe that JT Barrett got the first down in OT, but I think that OSU got away with some, some pass interference calls going against, or being uncalled, I guess, in crucial moments to even get to that point. It's possible that Michigan should have won this game, but like in the Penn State game, you can only look at the end results. Ohio State had less losses than Michigan and Penn State, and their loss was by only three. They had no out-of-conference loss, no 39-point loss, and they had wins against top 10 Wisconsin, top 10 Michigan, and they blew out the top 10 Big 12 champion Oklahoma Sooners as well. And I don't think it would have been possible to craft a better non-conference champion season if you even tried to. Penn State, on the other hand, won the conference championship because of their win versus OSU, and that was their argument. Certainly because of precedent, it makes sense to say you should have to win your conference to make the playoff at this point. And if that's a rule change that has to be made to stop two teams from the same conference from making the playoff, then I'm fine with requiring playoff teams to win their conference going forward. But in the ideal world, I think it's better to simply have the best team in each conference have the chance to compete for a title. The goal of the regular season, as I've stated, is to find the best team in each conference. And in 2016, I think it was pretty clear that the regular season proved Ohio State was the best team in the Big Ten. I guess you could say that the conference championship is supposed to determine who the best team is in the conference, and I'm willing to accept that in the future even if I don't think it always gives you the best team. I unfortunately think that this may be the best solution though, because we've reached the point where we can't really have an intelligible discussion about the playoffs because emotions have clouded the system. That's why on every selection Sunday, instead of giving you the teams right at noon, they interview all the teams on the bubble on why they think they should get in. It's all a bunch of nonsense, none of it matters, they already decided. A lot of Penn State fans felt vindicated because Ohio State was completely embarrassed in the playoff that year, and I'm still on the camp that you can't justify disagreeing because of what happened later. The only thing that should matter is what led up to that point, and this is why even as a Buckeye fan I agreed with the committee on tw in 2015 to put MSU in, despite their embarrassment to Alabama as well. All the committee defenders told Penn State fans that they shouldn't be mad at Ohio State in 2016 because they were picked as the three seed. Clearly, the committee fought highly of their quality wins and win margins that season, enough to put them above Washington at number four. People said that Penn State was really in a battle with, with Washington for fourth, and that o OSU and PSU drama was just because of the conference championship stuff, and that Penn State was never in a discussion with Ohio State for the three spot to begin with. And it makes sense to me, because I said already that I think Ohio State was clearly the best team in the Big Ten that year, despite the lack of a conference title. They had the tiniest of hiccups and otherwise had a perfect season against very solid competition. To me, Penn State and Washington discussion started dangerous discourse. This is because it introduced the idea of two teams in the same conference making the playoffs. Again, 2016 was a rare instance where Penn State won the head-to-head -head, but were still clearly flawed enough in resume to pretty definitively not be the best Big Ten team. And like I've said, if you aren't the best in your conference, you can't be the best in the nation. It's possible that Penn State was better than Washington, but Ohio State was already the Big Ten rep, the team that was determined as the best of the Big Ten. Washington still was the best team in their conference and had less losses than Big 12 champ Oklahoma, so I agree with the committee's decision to put in Washington. This again is where the best four teams becomes a toxic criteria because Penn State definitely had an argument to be in because of this criteria. Their win against Ohio State was more impressive than anything Washington did, but I'm guessing they were left out because they had two more losses, or they had two losses and Washington had one. This means that the committee is, is agreeing with me on the top four, but for different reasons. They thought that Washington was just in the four best teams. I thought they were the fourth best team to be the best in their conference. Big difference. The elephant in the room here is Western Michigan, 
I did not pay ent enough attention to them, and so maybe it's worth considering them this year, and I maybe I overlooked them. It seems like the committee valued them less than UCF and Cincinnati, which is kind of why I overlooked them. Again, the difference with Cincinnati this year was also that they actually were the fourth best team of the teams who were best in their conference. In 2016, that was Washington, and there was no Washington of 2020 because Notre Dame and A&M were not the best teams in their conference. 2017, in my opinion, though, is where the playoff lost all of its credibility and started to get exposed for being an ineffective system. This is because I believe it's the first year where the four best teams argument put in a team with no accolades. The playoff was actually set up to be perfect at one point. Clemson, Oklahoma, and Georgia were all one-loss conference champions, but then Wisconsin lost to Ohio State in the conference championship, so the Big Ten champ was now a two-loss team instead of an undefeated one. And Ohio State had some demons this year, unlike the year before. They lost to Oklahoma, but more importantly, they lost big to Iowa in a game that nobody saw coming. And the year before, their win against Oklahoma is likely what got them into the playoff. They were the best Big Ten team despite not being a conference champion, and defeated the Big 12 conference champion. It made sense to lead the Big 12 out, of, out given the circumstances in 2016. But this year... The game against Oklahoma came back to bite them because it was a hard game on their schedule that they didn't have to schedule. So Ohio State and Oklahoma effectively traded places this year, but unlike last year, the Pac-12 champion had two losses and looked relatively unimpressive. You know, Washington was there in 2016, so that's why they made the playoff. Instead, USC won the conference this year but got dominated by a Notre Dame team that lost three games, and they were dominated in two of them. So unlike last year for the Big 12, the Big Ten actually had a path in still. This would have solidified if Wisconsin just won, but they didn't. The other weird issue is the following dilemma. Should teams be punished for getting on the phone and scheduling a challenging opponent? Because it's hard to imagine that they'd take a one-loss non-champ Alabama team over a one-loss conference champion Ohio State team. Alabama did play FSU this season, but they ended up not being good at all. It almost seems like luck of the draw. You could make the argument that Wisconsin was the best team in the Big Ten still in 2017. Though Ohio State beat them narrowly in the championship game, they still had less losses than the Buckeyes. Wisconsin also thrashed Iowa that season, which decimated Ohio State. It was almost like Penn State, OSU, and Michigan arguments happening all over again. Except Iowa was never a contender like Michigan was. But something weird happened. I guess the committee did not value the Big Ten strength of schedule, namely Wisconsin's body of work. Wisconsin may have not won their conference championship, but Alabama did not either. And unlike Alabama, Wisconsin had actually had a claim to being the best team in their conference still. The committee was always going to choose Alabama, which bothers me. You could see it in the way that they overvalued Fresno State, a team Alabama beat early in the season. Many metrics, I think it was FPI, ranked Fresno State in the 50s, and if I'm not mistaken, the committee had them in their top 25 at the same time. It almost felt like they were artificially hyping up Alabama's pretty weak quality win list this season. So, Alabama was 11-0 this season and lost to Auburn in the Iron Bowl. This ended up being a blessing in disguise for them. They didn't have to play in a conference championship game and got the benefit of the doubt from the committee. Did they really have quality wins? Well, no. But the other resumes were flawed enough that they could get a justified entry as, quote, one of the best four teams. Alabama would then go on to win the title after getting this push of life from the committee. And them winning justified the decision and ruined college football for fans who care about the outcome of regular season games. We all know that Alabama is a great program and that's probably what gave them the, the benefit of the doubt over a team like Wisconsin. Since they won, it's clear that the, that the committee did their job of choosing the best four teams. But this year was gigantic and it was a gigantic loss for people who care about the outcomes because if we choose the best team from the SEC to represent the SEC in 2017, the committee wouldn't have chosen Alabama that year. They would have chosen Georgia, a team who also had one loss to Auburn. But unlike Alabama, they avenged that loss and won the conference championship. Maybe Alabama winning to some will be proof that we don't always know the best team in a conference before the playoffs, but I think if you want any form of consistency, you need to go for accolades over eye test, otherwise the games are meaningless. Alabama could have won against Auburn, but they didn't. What was UCF supposed to do better this year? One good argument I saw on Twitter is that Alabama didn't get a chance to avenge their loss like Georgia did, 
because of arbitrary division alignment. And this is actually a pretty good argument. But I don't believe that Georgia being in a better divisional situation entitles Alabama to get the benefit of the doubt and just make the playoff because of it. Just because a second data point versus Auburn wasn't filled doesn't mean that you get to make an excuse for Alabama. At the end of the day, the Auburn game that Alabama played was the most important game of their season, not just as a rivalry game, but as a necessary game needed to win their division. They lost the game, so they didn't make it to the conference championship. And that's just tough. The 2010 San Diego Chargers were by all metrics one of the best NFL teams ever, and they didn't even make the playoffs. Their offense and defense were ranked amazingly, but they went 9-7, and seven, mainly because of terrible special teams blunders. It's quite possible that if they made the playoffs, they could have gone on a title run. But the thing was, they did not win enough games to make the playoffs. And because the NFL runs off of purely standings and results, they didn't get an opportunity in the postseason. It's entirely possible that they could have won the title that year if they didn't have any bad blunders in the postseason. But even if they were one of the best few teams, they did not deserve to make it, because in the NFL, only results matter. Now, I know that in 2017, Alabama only lost one game, but I'm a firm believer that there should be only one team per conference in the playoffs. Again, because the criteria is the four best teams get in, sure, I guess 2017 Alabama deserved to be in since they won the title. But should something subjective be the criteria in the first place? And I don't believe so. I look back at the 2017 season and think that they didn't deserve to make the playoffs despite winning it all. They weren't the most deserving team in their conference. UCF was a topic of discussion in 2017. I think the committee could have at least considered them, but it's clear that this didn't happen at all. To me, I think it's likely that you should take Wisconsin as the best team in the Big Ten, but I also understand the hesitation after losing a conference championship game just the week prior. Now, what I would say is that, except it happened with Notre Dame this year and they weren't punished in the same way that Wisconsin was in 2017, despite getting embarrassed by Clemson, unlike the Badgers who actually had a pretty close game with the Buckeyes. I think you could still take the Buckeyes or UCF in 2017 and claim to have taken the, the fourth best team to be the best in their conference as well still. I understand that strength of schedule argument goes against UCF pretty hard, but it becomes a little harder to ignore when they go undefeated and a team loses two games. In 2017, Wisconsin was a one-loss team playing in the Big Ten though, so I think that I would have still taken Wisconsin. That's different this year, but we'll get to that later. I think that they got the selection again correct in 2018, but regardless, I have still have some complaints about 2018. The first three spots were pretty clear regarding the teams that deserve to be in. Like usual, I guess. And then there was the fourth slot. The consensus was that the spot would be taken by either Ohio State, Georgia, or Oklahoma. And I was absolutely livid that Georgia was even in this conversation. Because last year, I was told that a 12-1 Wisconsin team with a narrow loss to a great Ohio State team in their last game of the season couldn't be in the conversation. Then the year after, Georgia had a narrow loss to Alabama in their last game of the season, and they were in the conversation. Unlike Wisconsin, though, they were actually blown out by LSU earlier in the season. Unlike Wisconsin, UCF wasn't the only team with a better record than them. Oklahoma and Ohio State both had a better record than Georgia that year, as well as UCF again. I personally wanted the Buckeyes to make it in as a fan this year, and I thought that they had a reasonable resume this year to do so. Ohio State and Oklahoma were both 12-1 conference champions, and the media killed Ohio State for losing to Purdue, understandably so, because it was a horrible loss. But part of me thought that they had a legitimate shot still getting in because they absolutely dominated a super highly ranked Michigan team on top of having some solid wins in Penn State and Northwestern. Nothing on Oklahoma's resume was as impressive, but when it was announced that Oklahoma was the fourth team to be in the playoffs, I was okay with it. They were also a 12-1 conference champion, like the Buckeyes, and despite not having amazing highs, they only had one three-point loss to a solid Texas team. We had been blown out by Purdue, so I was okay with it. What I wasn't okay with was Georgia being ranked fifth. This is simply a statement for the committee to say that they thought Georgia was a better team than Ohio State, and that they valued their resume more. And as it should be clear by now, I value being the best team in your conference when it comes to title contention. But I get that you still have to do rankings. But how are you supposed to tell me that a team that was not a conference champion, lost more games, was also blown out once, and had a worse best win, how, how are they better? 
The committee has shown us now that losing to Alabama is considered to be a high-level achievement. A loss to even Alabama is not a shining star on your playoff resume. It's a toxic mentality. Let's be clear here. You aren't a bad team because you lose to Alabama. I'm just saying that losses still have to matter. It feels like they don't when so many people justify it due to the SEC being such a good conference. As far as I was concerned, UCF should have had more of an argument to be in the playoffs than Georgia this year. They went undefeated as opposed to losing two games and were the best team in their conference. My other issue with 2018 is less of a big deal and I kind of just accepted that it would never get fixed. I said that Notre Dame deserved to get in this year, but I take issue with them not being in a conference. Nobody ever calls out Notre Dame on this because to their credit, they usually schedule pretty tough games. Their strength of schedule usually turns out to be pretty good, but I think that this is misleading because not being in a conference means that if you have a good record, you aren't guaranteed to have to actually play, at the very least, a very good team in a conference championship game. What I'm saying is that playing a bunch of good teams would give Notre Dame a good strength of schedule, but they may be able to make the playoffs by going 12-0 without ever having to play a truly great team. You know, the types of teams that are playoff worthy. Playing in a conference championship game in a Power 5 conference usually guarantees that you do play against a great team to prove that you're worthy. They played a great team in Clemson in the playoff and got absolutely demolished by them. To me, something like this could have been avoided if Notre Dame joined the ACC and played Clemson in the conference championship game, which would have effectively been a quarterfinal. And I was delighted to see them play in the ACC in 2020, and I hope that it continues. But maybe it was for the better this year, because if they were in the ACC back in 2018, the committee would have just put Georgia in, wrongfully. And for the sake of finishing it, I was actually satisfied with 2019. Oklahoma was definitely the odd man out because the other three teams were so much better than them, but for a four-team playoff, there was no better choice. You could argue that Oregon got screwed over by playing a challenging Auburn team earlier, but I think Oklahoma had more impressive wins to begin with, and had Oregon won that game against Auburn, it may have been enough to get them through. It's hard to tell though, and we'll never actually know because that's not what happened. If Oklahoma and Baylor just didn't exist in 2019 for whatever reason, it's worth mentioning that Oregon should have gotten in over Georgia. This is because LSU was clearly objectively better than them, as evidenced by how much they dominated UGA in the conference championship game. Having a direct rematch of a 27 point blowout in round one of the playoffs would have defeated the point in the conference championship game to begin with between LSU and Georgia. Like, it wouldn't have mattered. And games have to matter. So now that we're in the present year, the weird year, the top two seeds are obvious. It's Alabama and Clemson. Third is kind of obvious. Personally, as a fan of the Buckeyes, I think the Big Ten changing the rules after the season started is pretty corrupt. The rule is pretty stupid to begin with, and it was pretty clear that Ohio State was in control of their division, but you can't just make assumptions that they would win. Nonetheless, this is what was decided, and you can't really keep an undefeated Ohio State team out unless you know they aren't bowl eligible, like 2012 or whatever year it was. I mainly just blame this year for being weird though. So this brings me to number four, as like the number four debate for this year, and we all know the result. And it's clear to me that in 2020, the system is an absolute joke. I've clearly shown that I don't mind having doubts on group of five teams, but you cannot have a system where it's clearly impossible for them to get in no matter what they do. If there was ever a year to put a group of five team in the playoff, it was this one. It would have maybe even been the least controversial decision. If there's no deserving fourth option, why not choose an undefeated team? It's not fair to the kids who play for UC or any group of five school to have a system like this. There's practically no point in even playing a game where no matter how well you play, you're not allowed to win. It's a stupid bet to make. The decisions the committee made last night have told us enough and finally confirmed the ugly truth. The college football playoff is not even accessible to the group of five teams. The college football playoff system is dysfunctional. This is confirmed because of how the committee has done the final rankings. Everyone thought it was between Texas A&M, Notre Dame, and Cincinnati. But Cincinnati was ranked eight below Oklahoma and Florida. We've just been told that losing two games back-to-back -to, -back to unranked Big 12 teams is still better than going undefeated in the AAC. We've been told that losing to an awful LSU team is okay because we're okay with saying that losing to Alabama by six is an achievement. I don't care if it's because a Florida player threw a shoe. A loss is a loss. I'm part of the result business, not the excuse business. 
Florida had a nice win over Georgia. Sure, you can say that that's the difference between them and Cincinnati. But that win was before the original playoff rankings, one that featured Florida one spot above Cincinnati. In the final rankings, the gap between them was the same. Florida was ahead by one spot. Except in this time period between the first and final rankings, Florida beat two irrelevant opponents in Kentucky and Tennessee, and lost two more games, including losing one to an irrelevant LSU team. So Florida going 2-2 two and two and Cincinnati beating a ranked opponent resulted in no change whatsoever between the difference of the two teams. The committee gave Cincinnati a lot of hope by putting them in 7th in the initial poll. One argument is going to be that they didn't play a bunch of games this month, so moving them down was reasonable. But then you have to consider that Ohio State missed games in the span also, and played less than Cincinnati did total. Ohio State got the benefit of the doubt, and their spot didn't get lowered at all. Benefit of the doubt should not matter. Results should. I could have said alright, sure, if Oklahoma had only lost one game. This is because they were the best team in their conference. But they lost two to irrelevant teams, and I think at some point, you have to punish them for it. I can deal with giving Power 5 teams a one-game buffer over the group of five ones because they play tougher schedules. But two games is pretty much a quarter of a season this year. Not to call them corrupt, but I also find it fishy that they let Iowa State jump four spots for beating a good, not great Texas team. It feels like disingenuous rankings like with Fresno State in 2017, if I'm being honest. It felt like they needed a backup plan in case Cincinnati was actually worthy. I know that Oklahoma and Florida weren't ever in the discussion, that Notre Dame is the one that got in, and that A&M were the first ones out. But I think Oklahoma and Florida were really just the committee's way of pretending that they weren't that close to putting Cincinnati when they actually should have been. I think that both Notre Dame and Texas A&M shouldn't be in, and this is because I don't believe the best four teams criteria can ever have a genuinely honest playoff at this point. If they took A&M over Notre Dame, the regular season doesn't actually matter because if Texas A&M, after getting blown out by 28 to Alabama, got a rematch with them, what's the point? Because Texas A&M already proved that they couldn't beat Alabama, or even hang with them for that matter. They literally had their chance already, so why should they get another one? If they won, they go undefeated, and in an ideal world, they get in over Alabama because of it. Unfortunately, if they did win though, in our reality, we would have just had a repeat of 2017. They would have put Alabama in at the 4 spot because they'd say that they're one of the 4 best teams, as a 10-1 non-champ, and the rematch would have happened either way. If Alabama won, then they play A&M. If A&M won, they would have played Alabama. And I think this really goes to show how flawed the system is. In the world where Notre Dame is not in, no matter who wins between Alabama and A&M in the second game of the season, I think, there's a rematch. Nothing changes at all as it'd be the 1-4 matchup. Consider this, and then tell me with a straight face that the regular season matters. It's not like our current reality is much better. Now, I agree with Notre Dame over A&M because they did actually beat Clemson, which is the better win between the two, but this is what I wanted to see in 2018. Notre Dame having to play a conference championship game. With Clemson actually being healthy this time, Notre Dame got exposed, so cool. We got the same matchup, except this time we didn't have to waste it on the playoff. It's effectively like having an extra playoff game. If Notre Dame wins the championship game, then they actually deserve to be in the playoff. And the same goes for Clemson. But Clemson annihilated Notre Dame, and it didn't matter much, because despite Notre Dame not being the best team in their conference, they still got to be in. Did the conference title game actually matter if both teams just got in anyway? What did it prove? It's not like it was close either. I could actually see the slightest of justifications if the, it was a close game. Because, you know, like, oh, Clemson lost without their quarterback, but Notre Dame was close, but they already beat them, so maybe there isn't a definitive answer. But there was a definitive answer because Clemson blew them out. I mentioned this early on, but Cincinnati probably isn't better than A&M or Notre Dame. Maybe they lose to Georgia and everybody will just say, we knew it. But if they win, then what? will never actually know what they would have done against Alabama. And even though A&M didn't get in, we do have the answer to how a Bama A&M matchup could have gone, because it happened, and Alabama won by four touchdowns. It's worth mentioning too that even if Cincy wins, nothing will change, because UCF beat Auburn too. Nothing changed. When Texas beat Georgia two years ago after the committee correctly chose Oklahoma over them, 
The team themselves, if I'm not mistaken, said they didn't care because it wasn't the playoffs. So how is Cincinnati or UCF or Coastal Carolina, how are they able to ever win? And the answer is, they can't. The fourth best team to be the best in their conference won't be in the playoffs this year, and it's not the first time that this has happened. And I think that sucks, because the best part of college football is the weekly urgency and meaningful regular season. And that's being sucked out of the sport every time the second best team in a conference is allowed to be in the playoff. The committee has to know that the system is bad, as is, because of all the mental gymnastics that they have to do, but I think they don't care because arguments are good for ratings, and a system that puts out bigger names is better for the wallet. And if you showed them a playoff of Alabama, Clemson, OSU, and Notre Dame before the season started, they'd probably be salivating at the idea. So we shouldn't be surprised that this is what actually happened. How do you fix it? Well, there is a lot of routes, but I think lots of them are very bad. Let's acknowledge a huge problem to begin with. This sport has five conferences that are considered elite, but less than five playoff spots. That means at least one Power 5 conference champion is guaranteed to be left out every single year. Maybe they like it this way because of the arguments, but I think it's crummy. Lots of people say that eight teams is the best route, but I hate this idea for college football. I want to solve the issues of the devalued regular season, not make them worse. In many seasons, we can't even find four worthy conference champions like in 2019. So why do we want there to be even more mediocrity in the playoff? At the same time, if you leave it as is, you'll never allow teams like UCF and Cincinnati to ever even get a chance. My favorite solution is conference realignment. You should have four major conferences with about 20 teams or so, and if your results aren't strong enough, you can be swapped out for more worthy schools. You play a divisional schedule, and the division champions will have a conference championship weekend that pretty much acts as a quarterfinals round to begin with, and the conference champions then just get a face-off in the playoff. This solution is irrational, however, because the current conferences will never want to change or give up their rights as a major conference. They won't want to break up rivalries as well. And additionally, teams like the 2016 Buckeyes may get left out of the de facto quarterfinals because of weird tiebreakers, so it's not entirely the perfect solution. Let's talk about what is the best feasible reality in my opinion. This is how I would fix college football. I think a 16 playoff is probably the best solution and the most happy balance. Yes, it means that more mediocre teams will get in, but this way it at least gives the truly elite teams an advantage via a bye week. An 18 playoff won't award that advantage to the perceived better teams, and more mediocre teams will get in to begin with. The goal should be to crown the most deserving team, so I think giving an advantage to the top two teams is fair here. Whether or not you do realignment after the first week or the first uh, round, I don't really care. I just think that six teams is the way to go when it comes to solving the most amount of the sport's current problems. I think that each of the Power 5 conferences should have exactly one representative every year dedicated to the best team in their conference. For simplicity's sake, this could just be the conference champion. I don't really care at this point. I think the best solution is just to say the best team because then teams like the 2016 Buckeyes that deserve it would get the nod, but I understand that precedents like this usually lead to corruption, so I personally don't mind if people would prefer it to just be conference champions. You can maybe have additional extra games if there's valid arguments to both sides, and a neutral site rematch between teams like the 16 Buckeyes and Nittany Lions. I know you can say rematches sound undeserved, but that's more so for cases like this year's Alabama, who is just definitively better than A&M due to them not losing a single game. Again, this stuff isn't important. Having one team per conference is, and ensures that the regular season is meaningful. The goal of the regular season is to determine the best team in the conference, and in this system you have to earn the right to compete for a national title by proving you're the best out of your conference. The top 25 rankings can stay and even determine the playoff seeding, I just don't think that it, it should determine which teams make the playoff to begin with. I don't even care if they want to put two SEC teams in the top five of the rankings. As long as the better one is the only one of the two in the playoffs, I believe the playoffs will be much more consistent at making games throughout the year more meaningful. And maybe it's not the best six teams in the playoff, but the problem of subjectivity is now deleted, the most deserving team will still win the title, and the problems of meaningless regular season games now gets fixed as well. The final spot goes to the best team outside the Power 5 conferences. I don't care if this is likely to be a perennial six seed. Now every team in the nation can no longer complain that they didn't have a chance, solving a huge problem for the sport. And instead of claiming a title of national champs like UCF did in 2017, they would have to earn it by proving it. And if you want to throw shade at their 2017 claim, you have to let them have the chance to prove themselves. Otherwise, it's a legitimate claim. 
possible that there will just be new drama with the best non-Power 5 champion because, you know, there's different conferences, but it's a hell of a lot better than what's going on now. And up to this point, I think it's been pretty clear cut who it should be. But we can't sit back and pretend like this won't be an issue. In my opinion, you should have teams play for the spot to prove it because results go above all else in this new potential system. Teams like 2019 Clemson wouldn't get a bye, but at the very least, they would have a significant advantage as a three seed getting to play Memphis over Oklahoma and Oregon who would have had to play each other. And the last thing to note, I don't know how, but make Notre Dame permanently join a conference, even if it means other teams have to join with them. I think you need to find a conference to have a legitimate claim as a contender because it forces you to prove that you're the best out of a relatively large and competent group. So this is how I think you fix college football. I'm sure this will anger any SEC fan who watches, but I really hope that people are willing to hear me out on this. I don't really have an outro because I just wanted to get my thoughts out on paper, but I appreciate you for listening, so have a good one. Feel free to comment, etc. Thanks.